pastors are liars. That's the first line of the article that my friend sent me this week. And obviously I was intrigued and was sort of prepared for anything. And as I read the article, the author was right. We lie. We don't mean to. The thing is, when we say this, we really believe it ourselves. We say constantly, and we've been saying constantly, the church is not a building. It's been a mantra for us here at St. Mark's for nearly a year now. But the truth is, pastors love buildings. There's nothing I love more than gathering people together, especially in a really beautiful and useful space. Whether it's a weeknight Bible study or morning worship or playing games or sharing a meal, I love it when we're together in one place. One of my greatest memories will forever be our first Sunday back in our sanctuary after the fire, when we combined all of those most favorite things with a feast together in our sanctuary. I loved everything about it. It was everything of why I actually really love a beautiful church building. It's a place to bring people together to meet God. Luckily, though, it is actually true that church isn't a building, even if we love them, and that church buildings aren't the only way to meet God and aren't the only place where God shows up. They just help us facilitate meeting God. And we've heard three stories today in children's time and in our readings of different ways that people met God. Ruth and Naomi have an encounter with God through each other, and their relationship with each other reflects God's love. When Ruth promises Naomi, where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay, and your people will be my people, and my God, your God, they join in God's covenant, and their friendship is an encounter with God's love that changes the community around them. And in the story of the feeding of the 5,000, people meet God in the abundance of a feast, the sudden joy of a moment where it seemed like there wouldn't be enough, and then somehow everyone had not just all they needed, but all they wanted to. The disciples met a God who would empower them to do God's work, and the crowds met a God who would provide what they needed no matter where they were. Friendship and feasting are both ways I like to meet God. They're familiar to me. I've frequently encountered God's presence in my friends and in life's celebrations, especially the celebrations that come after times of difficulty. But the story of Jacob at the River Jabbok is less familiar to me in terms of ways I like to meet God. But it may be the way we are meeting God right now. When friendship and feasting are less readily available, at least in the ways that we're accustomed to, we may find that we're meeting God in more of a wilderness, in encounters that are more frightening and overwhelming to us, or surprising at least. So we meet Jacob in our story by the River Jabbok, and he's on the journey back to see his brother Esau for the first time in years. Several weeks ago, we read the story about how Jacob betrayed and deceived his brother Esau, and so he must have been nervous going back to see him for the first time. And so Jacob is doing the thing Jacob always does. He's, he's scheming. He's trying to figure out a way out of this reunion that is bound to go badly. And then it happens. Alone in the darkness of a dusty riverbank, something lurches out of the black night and grabs Jacob by the throat. And this is not as simple as a metaphor of his past coming back to haunt him or a guilty conscience getting the best of him. If that were the case, Jacob might simply give in and confess his sins and see the right and straighten out his ways. But this riverbank battle isn't like that. It's physical and violent, tossing, turning, rolling around in the dust and mud, arms flailing, heads jarring, scratching, biting, brawl, with neither party giving in. It goes on and on through the night and into the wee hours of morning, the physical exhaustion just dripping from our scripture like the sweat running off Jacob's brow. It even looks like Jacob's winning for a minute until one injury turns the tide of the whole thing and it's over. Jacob had been ambushed. He'd been set up. 
all those long, sweaty hours of wrestling, Jacob believing he was in the fight from the beginning, that he had a chance to win, believing he was in control. But truthfully, it was all an illusion. Jacob was never in control. The stranger was in control the entire time. And the text seems to suggest that it was fated to end this way, that Jacob would come so close to victory and have that victory dashed just to make the defeat all the more stunning and devastating. The truth is he never really had a chance and was never really in the fight. Like Jacob, I don't always feel ready to meet the God who reminds me that I'm not in control of the world, the God with whom I wrestle and wonder who is in control. But not being in control of the world is sort of the way of the moment, isn't it, friends? We are reminded every day that we are not in control. And so perhaps we turn to what Jacob does. Jacob's last hope is when he recognizes that he never had a handle on the situation to begin with. And so the only thing he can do now is get a blessing get some reminder of the night. And he does. With dawn breaking, that stranger of darkness cries out to be let go. But Jacob, wounded hip and all, does not let go, not until he receives his blessing. What's your name? The stranger asks from the darkness. Jacob comes the answer. And then the stranger says, you will no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. And that is the blessing, the deep abiding blessing of being known. The stranger in the darkness names him. And in the world of the Bible, to be named, to have one's name known, is to be known completely. Deep down into the depths of our lives, all of their names had meaning. It's why even now when we baptize a baby, we ask just before we do it, what name have you given this child? To be named is a way of being known and a way of meeting God. To be named is to have our lives cut open and to be made vulnerable and known through and through for who we really are. And so this is Jacob's blessing, to be known for who he really is at his best and at his worst, and to still be entrusted with God's promises. Frederick, Frederick Buechner narrates the scene like this. He says, the darkness had faded just enough so that for the first time he can dimly see his opponent's face. And what he sees is something more terrible than the face of death. But the, it's the face of love. It's vast and strong, half ruined with suffering and fierce with joy. The face a man flees down all the darkness of his days until at last he cries out, I will not let you go until you bless me. Not a blessing that he can have now by the strength of his cunning or the force of his will, but a blessing he can only have as a gift. Power, success, happiness as the world knows them are his who will fight for them hard enough. But peace, love, and joy are only from God. And God is the enemy whom Jacob fought there by the river, of course, and whom in one way or another, all of us fight. God, the beloved enemy, our enemy because before giving us everything, he demands of us everything. Before giving us life, he demands our lives, ourselves, our wills, our treasure. The next day, Jacob crosses the river to meet Esau. In the way that we've been accustomed to Jacob operating, Jacob wants the land that has been promised to him as a gift. And although gift is the way that it is offered just as the blessing was, Jacob intends to take it in any way that he can. And so he sends lavish presents of servants and livestock ahead to Esau, hoping that he'll butter him up and reduce the severity of his revenge. Esau, it turns out, is one of the nicest guys in the world. And they eventually meet and Esau repels the presence and instead embraces his long lost brother. All is forgiven and tears flow freely and reconciliation is at hand. The brothers meet the presence of God in each other. 
And it would be great if I could tell you that this is the way it was for Jacob, that his whole life turned around from this moment and he took this lesson as his moral compass going forward and that from now on he didn't make any bad choices and stopped trying to weasel his way out of trouble. But real life is never quite that straightforward, is always more complex than our easy answer storybook ending morals might have us believe. Rarely do lives change completely overnight, even in the dramatic events of the riverside. And so when the embrace ends, Esau invites prodigal Jacob to come home with him, to live together as brothers, and Jacob agrees, telling Esau to go on ahead. He'll be coming shortly. But Jacob has one more lie in him. The tears barely dry on his cheeks. Jacob deceives his brother a final time and sets off down a different road, never to see Esau again. So is that it? I'm left to wonder from this way of meeting God. Is that how the Bible leaves it? First of all, after all the lying and manipulation, how does Jacob get to come out of it unscathed? I suppose the answer is that he doesn't completely. In one way or another, the long night on the banks of the river Jabbok did change Jacob. He may have gone off in another direction from Esau, but he did so a little more gingerly, painfully, with a limp. For the rest of his God-given life, with every back-splitting step Jacob knew, no matter how many times he could fool other people, shape them, work the system to his advantage, fulfill his own ambition and happiness and success, and pretend that he was in control of his life and his destiny, that limp was with him as a blessed and constant reminder that as he stumbled forward in life, there was one who knew him deeply and who knows us the same. Friends, this is the way that we have an opportunity to meet God right now, whether we like it or not a chance to meet the wild God who waits for us in the wilderness, who is waiting at the end of our rope, who is fire and cloud to guide us when we don't know the way, who will wrestle us out of our comfort and fear to make us the people God always knew we could be. It's a time we may come out of with a bit of a limp, not unlike Jacob's, but hopefully we'll come out, friends, also with that blessing that deep abiding peace and hope and joy that can only come as a gift that can never be taken or earned. That this will be a time we come to meet God and come to know what Jacob knows way down in the depths of his being with every step after this moment. Jacob knows the terror and grace of being known by universal love. Whatever way we meet God, We meet a God of love, a God who knows us and loves us. So my prayer, friends, whether you are feasting or wrestling or wondering in this time, that you will meet the God of love in a new way and that you will receive that blessing that abides within. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.